My name is uh, Anwar Bukhars. I am a professor of uh, countering terrorism and countering violent extremism here at the Africa Center for Strategic Studies. Uh, so it's uh, again, it's a pleasure to uh, to welcome you. Uh, so I will be moderating <clears throat> this uh, this session. Again, violence, conflict, uh, trends, and the objectives, as you have seen in in the syllabus, is to explore you know the typology and and drivers of violent conflicts in in Africa. Uh, you know, our panelists will analyze the strategic implications of conflict trends in the continent. You know, including the types of defense, you know, diplomacy, strategic leadership, developmental responses that might be relevant to addressing these uh, these drivers. As you have seen in, in the syllabus, which I uh, I'm pretty confident that you have consulted, uh, that you know, most analysts they 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 believe that Africa's democratic reforms in the aftermath of the Cold War would make African governments more accountable, you know, and, and legitimate, lead them to a reduction in political violence and, and civil war. <clears throat> Unfortunately, what, what happened, particularly since 2010, is that the number of armed conflicts, you know, that involve African states have increased, even if the number of related fatalities, you know, has, has, has declined. And, and this recent surge of violence is, is due to changing nature of conflict itself, as, as you will hear today. And in recent years, you know, the most prevalent forms of conflict in, in Africa have been protests and in riots, uh, followed by violence against civilians and then battles between state and non-state actors. Uh, so so to, 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 uh, to help us unpack you know, this, this issue we have with us two distinguished uh, uh, panelists uh, that will help us again unpack the trends, the drivers, you know, and prospects of violence in Africa. And we have Dr. Paul Williams here. He's a professor of international affairs and associate director of the security policy studies MA program at George Washington University and his research focuses on the politics and effectiveness of peace operations, the dynamics of war and peace in Africa and emerging threats in international uh, security. And between 2012 and 2019, Dr. William was a non-resident senior advisor at the International Peace Institute in, in New York. He has also served as a visiting fellow at the Woodrow Wilson Center for International Scholars, a visiting professor at the Institute for Peace and Security Studies at Addis Ababa University, and the list can go on and, uh, and on. I'll just stop there. The uh, second speaker is, uh, is Mr. <clears throat> Bamba Zolele. He's a senior fellow and director of the Africa program at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, CSIS. Uh, he's also a lecturer in African Studies at the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. And prior to joining CSIS, he was the Africa Senior Advisor at the International Republican Institute. Previously, he served as the course coordinator for Central and Southern Africa at the U.S. Foreign Service Institute. Um, he was also the Peter <clears throat> Lingen Distinguished Visiting Fellow and a National uh, Fellow uh, at uh, uh, Stanford University's Hoover Institution. And again, you know, the lists go on and on. Uh, he's well published uh, and his analyses have appeared in Journal of Democracy, New York Times and, and, other, uh, <clears throat> and other distinguished uh, uh, places. So with that, I think I'll, I'll start uh, with you, uh, uh, Paul, and, 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 and I'd like you to, to tackle <clears throat> or to address three, three questions here. Uh, if you can walk us through the current violence conflict trends in Africa and what are the key challenges to peace and security that Africa will face in the future. And then if you can talk about the drivers and, and causes of violence conflict in, in Africa and how they have evolved. And, and finally, the key strategic security implications of these conflict trends, you know, and what should the security sector 
leaders, right, do now in terms of leadership, in terms of policies, and in terms of institutions to, to tackle, you know, these, these drivers of, of conflict. So you have 15, you know, 20 minutes, and, and once you're done, we'll move to, uh, to Mr. Dizzle. And uh, thank you. And I've got, I've got some slides and charts for people. I don't know where they're going to appear, if we can uh, get those on the big screen. But um, first of all, thank you for the, the kind introduction. And secondly, it's good to see you. It's really nice to see people again in an in-person event. So I'm excited. I hope you're excited. I've not done this for three years now, nearly. So I'm, yeah, I'm very excited. It's great to see you here. Um, let's talk about war and violence and conflict in Africa, unfortunately, which, um, which COVID-19 hasn't changed. Um, we may have thought three years ago it might have had some major impacts, but clearly COVID-19 has not changed our day jobs. It's not changed the, the fundamental dynamics of, of war, conflict and security challenges in Africa. And um, if we could go to the next slide, please. Um, I'm not here to tell you uh, about conflict trends in Africa because you're the experts at that. Um, you know far better than I do the conflict and security challenges that you face in your own local areas, countries and, and regions. What my job is to do here, as, as Anwar has said, is to sort of step back a bit and maybe you haven't all had time to look at sort of the regional trends that have been going on across the continent as a whole. And so my job is to give you my sense of over the last two decades or so, what have been the major macro level trends in, in organized violence and conflict that we see? And then, as uh, Anwar said, I'll give you my sort of sense of what are the major drivers of, of those trends? and some of the sort of tactical um, changes and evolution that we've seen in, in the character of, of armed conflict on the continent. So that's my, my job for the next 15 minutes or so. And I wanna say it's gonna be a bit depressing, unfortunately. I hope the, the rest of the course is, uh, is more uplifting, but I'm gonna be a bit depressing for the next uh, 10, 15 minutes or so, because as you see on these first charts here, these are the overall trends of armed conflict and organized violence events in Africa over the last 20 years. On the left hand side, you'll see there um, it's broken up. This is from the ACLED data set, which I encourage you to, to look at in more detail. You'll see here this is battles, organized violence against civilians and what ACLED calls remote violence, things like IEDs, uh, drone strikes, suicide bombings, that type of stuff that happens at a distance. And as you can see on the left hand side, over the last decade in particular, things have got a lot worse rapidly. We're at an all time level of, of violent conflict events on the continent now, as you see on the left. And on the right hand side is uh, two data sets from Uppsala Conflict Data Program and ACLED plotting the fatalities, people killed in this forms of organized violence. And again, you see the worrying trends over the last 10 years or so in particular. So that's why it's gonna be a depressing uh, talk, I'm afraid, because things are, are getting worse. But my job is to sort of give you the overview now in a bit more detail. So the, the first thing to talk about is the politics. Um, what has been actually driving these armed conflicts in, uh, in these countries uh, and across the continent? I think you might need to click one more button on the, the next slide, please. If, uh, oh no, okay, go back to the other one then, I'll fill in the details. Um, there's, I'm going to put on the left hand side, these clouds are what I think are sort of mythical drivers of armed conflict in Africa. These are the six big ideas that I think if you read the newspapers and you read media discourse, or you listen to politicians and some of our leaders, and even if you listen to some academics, I think the six clouds on the, the left hand side there are sometimes what people think it's all about. So the first one, colonial legacies. Some people will still be blaming all the colonial histories and legacies for the continent's armed conflict. And I would argue that is too simple. This, <laughs> for a number of reasons, it takes away local agency. Uh, Africa's current wars are fought fundamentally about current modern issues not to do with colonial legacies. The second myth you'll hear, I think, that I put there is at the other end of the colonial spectrum, some people are still putting all the blame on post-colonial elites in Africa, but I think that's a bit unfair as well because Africa is not in isolation from the rest of the world. Africa's post-colonial elites are operating in an increasingly globalized um, context, and it is part, and it does matter what the other world, part of the world has been doing for Africa's conflicts, whether it's the arms trade, 
or jihadist movements coming from outside or you know, forms of organized crime. It's not just Africa's post-colonial elites. Ethnicity kills is the third one. Some people think wars in Africa are just all about ethnic and identity differences. I think it's much more complicated than that. If it really was ethnic or tribal differences that led to wars in Africa, there would be no end to warfare on the continent, right? So it's clearly not ethnic difference on its own that leads to, to armed conflict. Fourth, uh, you hear this a lot from governments and, and presidents and prime ministers who will blame uh, wars on greedy warlords, right? Or greedy rebels of one sort or another. But I don't think it's as simple as that either. Um, a lot of warlords and a lot of rebels start off, I would say, with legitimate grievances about politics and about being marginalized. It's not all about greed. In my opinion, there's never been such a thing as an apolitical war. Uh, it's always been about gathering resources and profit to use for ultimately political purposes. The fifth one, resource wars. Sometimes you'll hear this about the, the diamonds, the minerals, the timber, the coltan, the oil. Um, I don't think people fight because of what's in the ground necessarily. I don't think people fight just because of the existence of natural resources. It's a bit like ethnicity. There always needs to be other political dynamics. If those resources and the profits from them are not shared equally or fairly, and if there's a real scarcity over certain types of issues or resources, then we can start to see a bit more conflict dynamics, but it's not just resources that cause these wars. And finally, um, popularized by an American professor, Samuel Huntington, a few decades ago now, the clash of civilizations, you know, is it for some sort of religious and cultural reasons that we fight? And I would say again in Africa, there's not good evidence for that either. So those things I want you to sort of push to one side, even though you're going to hear them a lot in popular discourse. And for me, it's the three things on the right hand side that are key to understanding the, the conflict trends we see in, in Africa and in modern times. Governance and it's good old fashioned politics, basically. Who gets what, when, and how? How we set the rules of politics and governance in our countries and in our organizations. This is still crucial to understanding why rebellions and conflicts start. Resources, I've just said it's not all about resources, but I'm gonna backtrack a little bit and say it's about some resources, but it's not just as simple as sort of the mineral resources. I would say the most important resources in Africa for understanding warfare are things like land, water and environmental resources. So when I think about pastoralist communities and pastoralist forms of, um, let's say, conflict, either with uh, sedentary farmers or other pastoralist groups, there, resources to do with land, water, uh, grazing for livestock, these types of issues, yes, they're very important at a local level. And the final one I put up there is sovereignty. Because I think increasingly, whether we think we're being governed by foreigners, and whether we think we're being ruled by people who are not part of our community and we're not getting a say in these things, I think that's an crucially part of the, of the equation. The, the little thing that seems to be hidden there that I would have put up there is elite competition. The driver that I think is at the heart of those three things is a competition between political elites. And if I would just get one message across today from, from my talk about the conflict trends in Africa, I think that's it. That's the key dynamic that is driving things at the moment. It's competition between political elites in not every African country, but a bunch of African countries. So if we look to Somalia, Sudan, the Congo, Mali, et cetera, what you see is elite level people fighting. These are not revolts from the margins, the poorest people in the continent. These are wars that are often started by quite powerful elites. So with that, the main event, I'd like to just spend a, a little bit shorter time on mapping out some of the other key trends you'll find. And the next driver is here, the proliferation of armed groups. We just have more people with guns organized into political fighting factions than we did before. And as you can see from these two charts here on the left and the right, on the left, you'll see, we're seeing violence take place in more parts of Africa than ever before in the last 25 years. Those lines on the left going rapidly up, we're seeing violence in more places than ever. And that's partly because on the right-hand side, we've got more groups that are armed and organized and engaged in violence than ever before. And you'll see there particularly, they're not all states and rebels. 
Importantly, they're what Ackley call militias. And these can range from private sort of bodyguard groups that certain politicians or business elites will you know, have for themselves, right up to paramilitary forces and, and guerrilla rebel groups. But there's a, a proliferation and that's been a, a major problem. We've also seen two other main drivers in the last two decades. Uh, on the left-hand side, the rise of Islamist armed groups. And as you can see from the map from uh, Africa Center for Strategic Studies here, you guys still do the best map of the, uh, of the Islamist groups, by the way, I think. Um, and so you can see there we've got the Al-Qaeda affiliates, mainly Al-Shabaab in Somalia and Boko Haram in, um, uh, and Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb uh, in the Sahel. But then we've got now, depending how you count them, nearly nine um, Islamic State affiliates across the continent. And this, of course, has been a very important dynamic shaping the last 20 years in particular. On the right-hand side, though, um, we're, oh, coups are back in fashion again, aren't they, I'm afraid? Particularly in West Africa, we've seen some important dynamics uh, just in the last 18 months or so in particular, where coups have come back again. And as you'll know better than me, We've seen coups by very senior military officers. We've seen coups by mid-ranking military officers complaining about their senior military officers. And we've seen even a couple of coups by very low-ranked um, military officers who are blaming either their senior commanders or their politicians for a lack of equipment, a lack of resources, throwing them out to die in the battlefields, you know, out in the hinterland. So, Coups are back, unfortunately. So those are my four main drivers, right? Elite competition, um, Islamist groups, coups in Africa, and then a proliferation of groups. I want to focus, finally, on just some of the tactical trends that we've seen in, in conflict. And I want to identify, again, a few rather depressing sort of tactical and operational changes that we've seen over the last two decades. The first one here is about targeting civilians deliberately. Sadly, more and more um, war zones and conflicts in Africa have seen the deliberate targeting of non-combatants and civilians. Sometimes that's because they're blamed for being supporters of insurgent groups and, and rebels. Other times it's because they're defined as an enemy. Uh, and groups are actually trying to kill or, or maim or, or torture particular groups of civilians. But you see here, the lines show from two, those two data sets again, Uppsala and Akled, both of them count a big rise significantly in violence against civilians. The second sort of tactical shift and evolution you'll, you'll see over the last couple of decades is the urbanization of conflict. Now, I understand you were just looking at megatrends uh, across the continent earlier. And of course, urbanization has been a huge issue in the 21st century across the continent. So it's not surprising that we also see that play out in, um, in the continent's wars, right? more and more of those violent incidents that we see are happening in urban settlements. That doesn't mean always the biggest cities, of course. It can be right down to what I would call frontier urbanization, you know, small urban settlements around um, alluvial diamond mines or around coltan extraction, sapphires in Madagascar or wherever it is, right? But smaller elements of urbanization. But the violence is following that, and it's not surprising when more people are in urban settlements that we're going to see more violence there. But it poses a massive set of challenges for our policing, our peacekeeping operations, and our military responses. And as you can see there, sadly, Mogadishu, Somalia, is by far the, um, the most violent of all of Africa's battle spaces over the, that couple of decades. Sorry, that's from the same thing. That's just the number of people killed uh, in those battle spaces. And again, uh, Somalia, you'll notice here, there's a number of Somali cities that are very high up um, in the, the urban battle space there. The final tactical change that I wanted to flag up is what the ACLED database refers to as remote violence. And by remote violence, as the name suggests, they, they mean violence that takes place at a distance. So examples of remote violence would be things like artillery bombardments, airstrikes, also IEDs that have been placed and triggered remotely. Um, and also, as you'll, you'll talk about in a sec, suicide bombings, although that's not really remote in one sense. It's, <laughs> it's remote for the people on the receiving end, but put it that way. Um, as you see here, this has been a major chart. Again, the, all the lines go up in terms of the number of remote violent incidents and fatalities. On the right hand side, I just want to pass out one particular type of violence that they flag up here, and that's suicide bombings. 
we've seen a big, big increase. If you look there from about 2010 onwards, in my opinion, a lot of the initial increase in suicide bombings was linked to the Al Qaeda and Islamic State affiliates, particularly the Islamic State affiliates from 2014 onwards, where external jihadists were basically encouraging this type of technique in local uh, African rebellions, particularly Al Shabaab and then Boko Haram, and now uh, Islamic State West Africa province. Um, good news, obviously, they've come down a little bit in numbers, but obviously that's a big challenge. Uh, next slide, please. And the final one I wanted to, um, to point out there. Uh, yep, that's the one. Um, the other part of remote violence is aerial bombardment. So as I put up here, airstrikes and drone strikes are an increasingly important factor on the at least some battlefields. I would say the key theatres here that account for this big rise in the number of drone strikes and airstrikes would be Somalia, Mali, and then some of the, the wars now around Ethiopia, Sudan's, um, they're, the, they're the big ones. But all of these things together pose a, a sort of difficult terrain now on which you guys are, are having to operate in security wise. The last thing I would add, and it doesn't have a slide here because it can't show the sort of volume trends here, the other trend I wanted to flag up, though, is cyber security uh, and cyberspace. I don't think now we can understand Africa's war zones without understanding the virtual and, and digital dimension on which they're taking place. And I mean this in two senses. Um, one is to do with propaganda. Uh, cyberspace now is increasingly where we're playing out the propaganda battles and governments and rebels are fighting over control of the narrative of what the war is about and how the war is going. So cyberspace is important for that. But it's also important for more practical and operational sense, yeah? particularly as we see more drones and airstrikes that are actually digitally based or digitally linked battle systems in Africa, cybersecurity and cyberspace issues are going to be increasingly important. And also as tools as, of mobilization for you know, encouraging recruits, gathering resources, cybersecurity and cyberspace are gonna be increasingly important parts of, of the conflict terrain moving forward. So I'll stop there. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions you have about the, the sort of more strategic aspects of this afterwards, but- uh, All right, thank you. Uh, you, Paul, you mentioned how, uh, how bets, Uh, they have increased across uh, you know, all categories of, of political violence, including, uh, as you outlined, you know, battle explosions and remote violence, uh, violence against civilians, uh, suicide bombings, uh, aerial bombardments, and cybersecurity. Also talks about the geography of, of violence, uh, even if that geography is not starkly different than in, 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 in previous uh, years. Uh, you discuss the, uh, the growth patterns of political violence in and across states and, and how that underscores that current uh, African conflict patterns and frequency are not due, you know, uh, only to, uh, as you stated here, to those six clouds, you know, uh, ethnicity and greedy warlords and resource wars, et cetera. So these are the poor explanations you know, to understand the, the drivers. So we have to go beyond these dominant interpretations of, uh, of, uh, of what drives uh, African, uh, African conflicts. So, so now we move to, uh, to our second uh, panelist, uh, Mr. Bizzolili, and I would like you to, to address, based on what you just heard, Dr. Williams' analysis of violent conflict trends and, and drivers. I mean, what is your assessment uh, of African state responses to address, you know, these drivers of, of conflict? I and mean, what are the challenges facing African states in addressing uh, internalized conflicts, particularly when governments, in some cases, you know, have become the source of violence against, against civilians? So if you can provide some, some examples, that, that would be great there. And then finally, what are the lessons learned? for better responses to violent conflicts in, in Africa? And what should security you know, sector leaders do now, again, in terms of leadership policies and, 
institutions to address the challenges uh, to peace and, and security in the country. So the floor is yours. Again, we'll have 15, 20 minutes. Thank you. Uh, it's always been a challenge to speak with Africans about Africa. You are the expert, as uh, my colleague Paul Williams said. What uh, I always find much more useful is uh, our conversation during the queue and then the question and answer, where I think my job today is to provoke you a little bit and then uh, so that we can have the right discussion when we, uh, we get to the questions and answers. Um, my colleague did a tremendous work uh, in framing uh, some of the issues. What I would like to talk about is actually the role of leadership, choices, and expectations in the context of this conflict. I think it's very important to contextualize it because the historical background to this conflict. And that historical background is the continuous and continued transition from post-authoritarian regimes to where the states in Africa are today. What does that I mean? The original transition from post-authoritarian regime in Africa happened at independence. Most countries in Africa had been colonies and colonies were not democracies. Colonies were not states. Colonies were specific special regimes that were very repressive and very exploitative. So they were not promoting democracy. They were the governor general in African West Africa, French West Africa, or in uh, Brazzaville or in Leopoldville, was not a Democrat. He was not elected. His interests were not those of the people. But that's the way most African countries get introduced to the notion of the state, at least the Westphalian states. So from one day to the other, they say you're independent, now run your state. The consequence of that is, I don't care who you were, what country you were in, your chances as a prime minister, as a president of becoming a dictator, were about 99%. Not because these leaders were bad people, they were actually very good people, and they'd hoped and dreamed for countries that would work. But they were dealt with cards that did not stack up well, yeah, did not stick, uh, stack up well. So what do I mean? If you're the prime minister of country X, Patrice Lumumba, your president Kwame Nkrumah in Ghana, or Azikiwe in Nigeria, you name it, you are dealing with a disparate conglomerate of people who had never were citizens and overnight they're supposed to be citizens. You're dealing with a real estate that was never a state. All of a sudden you call yourself prime minister and you're supposed to rule a state. The people in the South are questioning your legitimacy. Who are you? My great grandfather has been fighting the Brits for the last 200 years. We don't know you. You come from the North. Here in the South, I am the paramount chief. Why do I have to follow you? So your choices are very difficult. You can either co opt me as a paramount chief, and by that I mean you'll send the Fox Public or whatever army you have in that part, which was exactly the army that the colonials used to oppress people. You were hoping to do the right thing, but the moment you deploy those units, I see you as a white colonial in black skin. You are no longer my fellow citizen. So right there from the, up the bat at the outset, you are alienating big chunks of your own country. So that's one set. The other option, you can come to the paramount chief in the north who says, look, we don't even know your people. These are ethnic groups and regional entities that have never worked together. Yeah? So if you take a country like Sudan or a country like DRC, the size of Western Europe, if you're living on the Atlantic coast in DRC or you're living in Kisangani up in Stanleyville at the time, and you juxtapose the European map on top of that, we're talking about Portuguese and Norwegians. What do Portuguese and Norwegians have in common? Nothing. The other guys, they call Rodriguez, they fish. The other guys are called Lars and Johansson. A totally different culture, climate, everything is different. And this is what the deal. So how do you forge a state? Because really the issue here 
is state building. You have to build the state out of the colony. And that means you have to forge it. And every time we talk forge, we're talking force. So all of, a, all of a sudden, the entire meaning of monopoly of force by state changes the definition. There's a new prime minister. Your choices are very limited. You can co-opt them or you can. Co-opt them means, hey, Paramount Chief who's challenging me here, I say, can we take your son? Uh, you have some good son we can take to school. Or we have a good son that who can become minister of defense. That's what we'll call eventually corruption, patronage, and other things. So those are the stark choices they dealt with. So just in terms of creating that state, it's faulty at the outset. It didn't take 300 years. These leaders did not have the luxury of George Washington or Thomas Jefferson to sit in the study and talk about Rousseau. Age de Lumière. They have no time for that because the crisis everywhere in the country, just the day after independence, everybody's challenging your legitimacy, which becomes a big source of conflict. Democratization, forget about it. It was on paper. The entire toolkit you have is really about herding cats. And if you're herding cats, you know it can be, it's not a very fun exercise. But then you also then, Quickly, I'll challenge with this notion of nation building. If you're Nigeria, these are big nations within a country that is called Nigeria. So they're not even see, ask a Nigerian where they're from, they'll tell you I'm Igbo. And they have to say, no, no, I ask where you're from. Right? They will say, I'm Yoruba. I'm say, no, no, where is, what state? Tell me Port Harcourt. So the identity itself becomes very challenging. How do you build then your citizenship in the country? The very notion of citizenship, which is a pillar of a Westphalian state, becomes problematic. In most African countries, they even tell you that the president is not from that country. If you ask Congolese, they say Kabila is not Congolese. If you ask Nigeria, they say Sani Abasha is not Nigeria. And you go to Malawi and so on. Zambia, they say ah, Kaunda is Malawi. So all that is actually an expression of all these challenges that you see. So what does that mean then? It means there are big segments of society that are excluded. This is like Mauritania. This is like Mali. If you're Tuareg in the spaces, the so-called ungoverned spaces, which are always governed by somebody. There's never, like Paul was saying, there's always a warlord, there's always a chief. There's no such thing as ungoverned space. Somebody's governing it. It may not be people out of Bamako, people out of Kinshasa. If somebody's levying taxes, somebody's calling the shop. So those are kind of the historic side of things. You have to build your state, and there's a friction there, and this has been a source of conflict in a lot of places. If we think of the birth of South Sudan, it is part of that. Because a country like Sudan, you ask, what kind of, when I say state building, the main question at independence is, what kind of state shall we have? If your country is the size of Western Europe, do you want to have a centralized government or do you want to have a federated kind of with the configuration of semi-autonomy state? What kind of military will you have? Do you have the kind of military that is from the North? This is another challenge we have. You go to certain countries, no parents want their kids to join the military because that military is not a Republican army. It is considered the army of the North, the army of the Baule, the army of the Tuareg, whatever it is. So this even notion of building the state, but this stems from the time of the colonial. What army did your country have? I submit to you, all your country's colonial armies, they were not serving the interests of the people. And a lot of those countries, if not most of them, have those military have never fully transferred and transformed and converted into a Republican Party. Not because people don't want to, but the dynamics. And to the coups. If I see the first coup happens in Togo, Ghana, and I'm in Congo, I don't want the chief of staff to be the same guy. He becomes suspicious. I want to have somebody who's loyal to me. Obviously, all the officers who are within the ranks, who know they're very competent, 
and don't consider my chief of staff competent. Uh, the grievances just continue fine. So to go to some of the question that uh, who has posed to me, what is my assessment to address this driver? My assessment is we to go back to the driving board and the driving board is about those issues that the country is inheriting from the colonial system. Just because there is a Germany and is configured the way Germany is, doesn't mean Ghana has to be like Germany. The countries have not had a chance to go to the drawing board and have an honest debate. Ethnicity is not the cause of conflict. The ethnicity can be a rallying point for all the other negative dynamics that we know. The president can rely on ethnic groups and create a presidential guard, which by the way is very homogeneous. Typically, a presidential guard is very homogeneous. This is what I'm talking about, the army of the north of the south. And they typically designed to serve as a bulwark against the rest of the military. So the trust doesn't even exist between these presidential or special units. They're not always called presidential units. They may call something else. There's friction there. There's lack of legitimacy. We have to go back and say, who is a citizen of this country? How do we become citizens of this country? We adopted the very notion of citizenship from Europeans. The Europeans didn't have diverse countries. The Europeans have one country. I was talking earlier about Norway or Sweden. Everybody's called Lars and Svensson. That's not what happened in Bali. That's not what happened in DRC. By your name, they already know where you come from. They know exactly what region you come from. You may not have that promotion because of where you come from. And there's nothing, there's no way you can shed your name. So this is, so we have to go back to the table. What does it mean to have a nation out of many nations? In the US, we talk about a pluribus unum. It's a fancy term to say out of many one, but it's also a different experience. The Europeans came here, killed a lot of the, exterminated a lot of the local, create a new concept. That's what I mean by Jefferson could sit in his study and talk about Rousseau and Burke and have all this intellectual underpinning. If you are Patrice Lumumbo Kwame Kuma, you don't have a lot of time for that stuff because there's agitation across your country in different levels at different layers. So how now 30 years, 60 years for the average African country, I think the time has come to go back and address those issues. What country, what model do we have that reflects ourselves? Um, so also, what is the notion of state being the source of instability? I think I've talked a lot about those already because if the prime minister was trying to survive because he needed to rely on his people, so the state itself is feeding this. Uh, if you're a president and you feel the need to have special forces that are loyal to you and you're denying promotion to other officers or denying talent to come into your ranks. Because when you have armies of the North, the presidential guards, they're not effective. And the reason they're not effective because the talent pool is limited. Yeah, they can have training by Israelis, by whosoever, but they're still recruiting from either the same village or the same region. And all your best intelligence officers cannot come from the North. All your best logistics, logistics officers cannot come from the East. So you're not recruiting from the right place. And the result, we, saw this, we see this often, it suffices that a small crisis arises and the social forces collapse often. And everybody say, how come they didn't fight? Well, what do you think they would have fought? Fight for what? Uh, and then S SSR, uh, security sector reform, I think need to be taken seriously. Uh, the world is entering a different era now, and Africa is even entering a second era with, first of all, the new scramble for Africa. If you go to Djibouti, you see what I'm talking about. You see the Turks. Djibouti is a small country, but you see the Turks, you see the French, you see the Americans, you see the Chinese, you see the Gulf Arab states, and you wonder what is everybody doing in this place? How does that advance the cause of Djibouti? Do the Djiboutian have the time to sit and do the thinking that I'm talking about and say, here are the fault lines, you know, all the points, the red points that Paul had outlined there, resources, ethnicity, how do we tie this together so they become a coherent whole? 
not disparate bunch of different calls. Um, so SSR, I think, is a key element here because the armies in most of these countries are still an extension of colonial armies. So we need to re reinvent those militaries so they represent the people and the military becomes a profession like any other. In other words, people are excited to join the military and parents are happy to tell the daughters and sons, by all means, take the exam to the academy. The selection should be clear. Um, and then I want also to drag at something else, which is, uh, so the lesson learned you talk about, they're there, we've, we've had 60 years at average, on average 60 years to learn our own lessons. They're similar, they're very different experiences, but the lessons are similar. I subscribe to you, submit to you from Tunisia all the way to South Africa, they're the same challenges. Even countries like South Africa did not escape this. Um, the other point I want to talk about, beside the new scramble where Africans have to deal with the other dynamics of the new world, the new world order, is regional or economic communities, the ECOWASs of the world, the EGADs, they've become part of the problem. And they've become part of, in many ways, cautioning conflict. The African Union. How are they doing that? They're not living up to the charters of this very institution. So you have a place like ECOWAS, which I thought for many years were exemplar of integra regional integration. There was a charter. When the president didn't abide by them, the entire community came and said, hey, no coup d'etat here, go, go away. But we've seen that over the last few years, especially with Nigeria relinquishing its power, its leadership, that anything goes in ECOWAS. The coups that we're talking about, the majority of them are in ECOWAS. So we have to ask why. Uh, these officers cannot just be evil. They, they're trying to do something. They're part of the communities. Uh, also the manipulation, what I call constitutional coups, which don't make the news all the time. President tinkering with the constitution to stay in power longer. They're happening all around the world, all around Africa, but they're also happening in ECOWAS. So where is the role of these organizations if they will not step up to the plate? So to me, uh, part of the lesson learned is this. Just because there is a European Union, doesn't mean we have to have an African Union. European Union, Congo is the size of Western Europe. The European Union is about 26 countries, well, take give or take. And they still disagree. They still do kind of things, but they have countries in the European Union that stand for certain principle and kind of shepherd everybody else. Germany in economic, France, the UK when, you know, where they were in there. So the hegemon, one of entre guillemets, who are taking the role of policing everybody else. Africa is 54, 55 countries, depending on how you count with a lot of variety, and then you want them to be one organization. There's no union of Asia. There's a reason why there's no union of Asia, because the differences are so big. I support REX. I think they're very important. They much more make more sense than to have AU, which is so distant. What commonalities were between Libya and the Sudan? How common are they? Anyway, so some of this thing, I just want to try that to provoke us to into discussion, but I think we need to go back to the drawing table to address the drivers and this trend to actually think of it. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Um, I think resolving, you know, Africa's various conflicts definitely requires revise the diagnosis of instability, as you said, that aren't shaped by, you know, uh, particular interests or particular uh, ideology. So we have to revisit solutions to, uh, to long-term uh, crises. And as, and as you said, probably the essence of it is, you said, is that how do you forge a state, a state that is legitimate, a state that has credibility, you ask them with fundamental questions, I mean, what kind of, of military do, do we want? Uh, how do we configure uh, state institutions? So we have to go back to the to the drawing board here uh, to figure out each country, you know, what, uh, what what kind of model. I mean, does it that that does it need? So the, the question, I guess, the challenge is how do you build uh, inclusive states uh, that have accountable 
you know, security uh, uh, sectors here. So we have to, to reinvent uh, probably our, our, our military and, 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 and security sector. So anyway, you are, you are right provocative. I mean, you, you raised the uh, excellent uh, questions here. I mean, both uh, distinguished uh, speakers.